Almighty God, Father in heaven, so many generations ago, you gave our forefathers, you spoke your word to them. So many didn't listen. So many choose the wisdom of the world. So many relied on their own wisdom, and history shows us it led to destruction. Then you came to us with the word of the cross. The word of the cross, the fullness of the gospel, from the incarnation to the crucifixion and the resurrection. And yet so many still do not believe. I pray this morning, Lord, that as Scott, Pastor Scott delivers his message of your word, that we open our ears, that we open our eyes, that we open our minds, and we open our hearts to your word, Lord. I pray that we stop drifting, that we throw out an anchor. I don't want to be a plastic Walmart shopping bag blowing in the wind, Lord. Let your word be our anchor. Let your word of the cross, which saves us all, anchor us in your love. And in his name we pray. Amen. Mike, if you guys don't know Mike, one of our leaders here at the church. We call him Cowboy Mike. Some call him Catfish. Mike, that's not going to work. Good to be with you, church. How's everyone doing? Good? Once again, good to see you. Looking forward to diving into Genesis 6. So turn it there in your Bibles, if you would. Genesis is the first book of your Bible. Uh, big thanks to Ryan for speaking last week and giving me a morning off. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. Give him a hand, if you would. So Genesis 6, turn your Bibles there. So there's these things called gyms. Is, it, is anyone familiar with a gym? You know, a place where they lift weights or swim or something like that. I've heard they're out there. I'm not familiar with one, but... Uh, there's this one gym out there, their tagline is no judgment zone. Okay, Planet Fitness, no judgment zone. So this week a guy went in there in Massachusetts and uh, showed up to the Planet Fitness gym and then got naked. And the police were called. And the police showed up and there's this naked man at Planet Fitness doing yoga right in the middle of, at, for everyone to see. And he's like, I thought this was the no judgment zone. And they arrested him and booked him on disorderly conduct. <laughs> um, obviously, he took the thought of, well, I could just show up and do whatever I want. A little bit too literally. And boy, don't we do the same when it comes to life, right? We, we show up in this thing called the world and we think we can just kind of do whatever we want and we realize we can't because there are consequences and there's a creator that has designed us to function and live in such a way and when we do not live according to his precepts and design that there are consequences there's not some spiritual police that are going to show up, but we know innately that when we don't live according to how we're designed, we're going to pay the price. And so this morning we turn to Genesis 6 and we view a world that many of us would not want to, to view because it's a, it's a reflection of, of us. So you turn to Genesis 6, we're going to look at verse 8, and, and the world has just gone crazy when it comes to its corruption and when it comes to its wickedness. Uh, I was listening to a, a radio interview this week with uh, an old program director for Facebook. And I don't know, Facebook's been in the news this week. I mean, I think they lost $100 billion in one day. Is that insane or what? And really all that $100 billion loss was their, 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 uh, their profits for one month. So for them, they're like, $100 billion, uh, chump change. I'm sitting there going, wow. I mean, that's how big this entity is. But the interview was more on the content and how Facebook needs to do a better job of protecting what people post and what people put up there. Because, you know, while it could be a force for good, there's a lot of garbage on there. And, and the 
program director was like, listen, Facebook is not producing content. It has no moral obligation because it is merely a vehicle for the content that people are producing and putting up there. And so this program director was like, I think there's people using Facebook as a scapegoat. And then here's the phrase that got me. It's almost like blaming the mirror maker when you look into the mirror and you don't like what you see. Well, throw the mirror out. That's a horrible mirror. And yet this program director, who as, as far as I know, does not know God or, or he's basically saying what this is, is a mirror of our culture. And these are the things that people don't like to look at and they don't like to acknowledge and they don't like to have to come to terms with like, you know what? While there's a lot of good around us, it's hard to see the good when there's just so much corruption and wickedness. And yet God's message to us today is to remind us that it's been with us from the very beginning. It will be with us, but there's a God who shows such great and grace and mercy in the midst of it all. And so we get to talk about Noah and the flood and hopefully over the next few weeks, maybe clarify some misunderstandings of what was going on. And so today the primary focus is on preparations for the coming judgment. Because what we realize in Genesis is that there's a judgment coming and God is gonna use a flood to judge the world. But even in his judgment, there's mercy because he chooses to save one family out of it all and that's Noah. So turn to Genesis 6 if you're there, and we're going to start at verse 8, and we're going to go to the end, and we're going to look at the preparations for the flood. Now, next week, we get the privilege of specifically talking about the ark, because I want us to understand what the Bible says about the ark. And again, what the Bible says and some of our modern conceptions of it are, are sometimes different. And so I want us to understand why the ark is important, why God spends several chapters talking about the ark and the flood and, and Noah. But my hope and my prayer is that you would be encouraged by the life of Noah. And we're going to talk about how not only preparations for the flood is important, but the kind of person you are in the midst of preparing yourself for, for what's to come is, is vitally important. So turn to Genesis 6, starting at verse 8, you, you read these words. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. You know, you need to circle that verse because that is a key jumping off point for us. Verse 9, and these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, number one. Number two, he was blameless in his time, number two. And he walked with God. Number three, we're going to come back to those three things because they're critically important in talking about the person of Noah. Now the earth had, now Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was corrupt in the sight of God and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood, and you shall make the ark with rooms, and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, and the breadth of it, 50 cubits, and the height of it, 30 cubits. And you shall make a window for the ark, and finish it to a cubit from the top, and set the door of the ark in the side of it, and you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I, even I am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which all the breath of life from under heaven, everything that is on the earth shall perish. And I will establish my covenant with you and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female of the birds after their kind and the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing on the ground after its kind, two of every kind shall come to you to keep them alive. But as for you, take for yourself some of all the food which is edible and gather it to yourself and it shall be food for you and for them. And Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. May God bless the reading of his word today. Next week, we're gonna talk about the specifics of the ark. Today is setting us up for why the flood is coming, why God is judging the world. Now, the flood in general is one of those common stories that is found all around the world. As 
Anthropologists have studied people groups and civilizations. It seems like every major, major society has a story of the flood. Some of you are probably familiar with one of the most famous ones. It's called the Gilgamesh epic. Now, the thing that sets the biblical account of the flood apart from the others is the others are purely mythological. They're saying that there is this evidence of a flood, but they don't give us any historical or any specifics regarding the event. They turn the event into mythology. The Bible alone is the one that gives us detailed historical measurements of the ark and details about the time. And so this sets the account apart. See, where you have mythology, there's, they're based upon a common story, and that story is actually a, a historical event, and the account of that event is found right here in the Bible. And so, why did the flood come? Why did God choose to destroy what he had created in the earth, or on the earth? It's because the corruption of the world had gotten so bad. See, let me, let me give you a few verses to kind of set this up because Noah and the flood and this whole account is mentioned at least 50 times in the Bible in, in at least six different books. Write these passages down. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus cites Noah and the event of the flood as a historical event and he uses it to basically say, look how this is also important to understand you need to prepare yourselves for my second coming. Jesus said, for as were the days of Moses, Moses so Noah, sorry, so we're, we're rushing history when we go to Moses. So, so in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the son of man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And when Noah entered the ark, the flood came and washed everyone out. Jesus says, just like that happened, so much more prepare yourselves for my arrival. And then we have the account in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, which says this, uh, talking about Noah's faith. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, which is remarkable, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he has condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. The, the fact that Noah would do something so unthinkable, build an ark in a place so far from any body of water, not understanding a flood concept, and yet he did it because God had asked him to do it, demonstrates great faith. And we're going to talk about that here in a bit. Peter, in two places, in 1 Peter and 2 Peter, talks about it this way. He says, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So you know how specifically Peter's referring to this event saying, God, when it came to the, destroying the earth, he saved eight people. Now there were millions of people alive during the time of Noah. God saves eight people. They are the only people that were faithful to God. Can you imagine this? Of a world of millions of people, eight people are the only ones that love God. And yet, what does it say? God had shown great patience to these people, and yet they still not turn, did not turn to him. And then 2 Peter says these, these words, 2 Peter 2, 5, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserve Noah, a herald of righteousness. So he was not just an ark builder, he was a preacher of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So I wanted to give you those four uh, passages to help give us a well-rounded picture of this character, Noah. And we're going to come back to these things here in a bit. But why is this account important? It's because we need to see how severely God deals with unbelief when he deals with his creation, uh, turning against him. And that's the first point in your notes. It's society's persi persistent corruption. The fact that God looks upon the world, and we saw this cut two weeks ago in the beginning part of Genesis chapter six, that people only did evil continually. I mean, this is not a good assessment of humanity. God knows the heart of people and he's looking out saying, is there anyone that even wants to do righteousness? Is there anyone that even wants to love me? Here's the creator looking at his creation and the creation wants nothing to do with God. 
And so what's God left to do? He's looking upon creation and it's literally breaking his heart. In the previous verses, it says it grieved him because God is so intimately involved with his creation to think that he is distant and he's a standoff God and he wants nothing to do with our lives is a lie. He loves us and he's designed us to love him. And when that is not reciprocated, there's, there's, a, there's a breakdown. And God looks at the world and says, there's only evil continually. They are persistently corrupted. And it's not that it was just a one-time deal. They kept doing this. This was a habitual part of their lives. And God looks upon this and it grieves him. And not only were they corrupt, but they were violent to each other. There's this, there's this sense that they are self-destructive. See, it's not like, you know, we, we're so quick to go, that's so unfair of God just to, to destroy the world. They're destroying themselves. And God's sitting there going, instead of this being a mockery, a travesty against me and my design, I'm going to wipe them out. And this is a hard thing for us to accept. It's like, well, I, I just heard a new story on my way in this morning about the U of A. I try not to talk about U of A. I'm so anti-U of A, it's not even funny. But we'll talk about U of A because they need Jesus too, right? All right, so, so one of the fraternities is being closed down down there because of their unethical behavior. So the board basically said, we are closing this fraternity down because they don't follow the ways of our handbook for fraternities and sororities. Does the U of A have a right to do this? Yes, they have clearly stipulated what's right and wrong behavior. And obviously this fraternity does not want to adhere to the rules. No one's saying, U of A, you can't do that, right? Now you got this renegade fraternity out there, right? No, they have every right to. And God has every right to shut humanity down when they're not living up to his precepts, right? I mean, it's one thing to talk about a fraternity and a board of a universe. It's another thing to talk about the Almighty and his creation. And what we have to realize is that God is a holy God and God is a righteous God. And God is a God who can do whatever he wants with his creation. How many times do we read in the Bible, in what way does the pot, pottery have anything to say to the potter maker? You are the clay and he is the potter. Who are you to say, don't make me this way or don't do this to me? And yet, we're reminded that God shows great patience even in the midst of such corruption. God shows such great patience in the midst of such violence. And so this is a dark period in history, but it's a period of history where people, men and women, are so self-destructive. So we have to understand how gravely dark this is. And not to think of Noah's ark in a, in, in a sterilized way. We want to approach the Bible and the scriptures and try to sanitize this and make it easier to digest. And we got to realize sin is dark. Sin is horrible. And it, it basically feeds people to be corrupt and violent. You look around us in our world and there's one, one common denominator when it comes to the things that are extremely disagreeable to us when it comes to the way we act towards one another. And it is sin. It is sin, and praise God, God has overcome our sin through the person work of Jesus. We'll talk about that more in here in a bit. Someone once said that, you know, we, we tend to sterilize the story of, of Noah's Ark, especially when it comes to parents who want to put a mural in their new baby's bedroom, and they, and they want to go with the whole Noah's Ark theme. And, and I just want you to say, if you've done the Noah's Ark theme in your kid's bedroom, you're not going to hell. Don't worry, you can be forgiven. Because my friend said, if you're going to do the Ark theme, you might as well go full out and have the floating corpses on the wall too and the, uh, painted in there, right? We have this picture of rainbows and pigs and aardvarks walking into the ark. And it's like, that's not the picture. If you're going to be accurate, let's have some deceased bodies floating in the water as well. And this is a horrible thing to consider, but yet it's in the word because God wants us to understand how radically he deals with sin. Which brings us to the second point, and it's this. Noah's precious character. Because here's what I believe God wants us to understand at the outset of talking about this account in history. I'm not concerned primarily about the world at large. 
I'm concerned about the kind of person God wants me to be. I'm not concerned about your circumstances primarily. I'm concerned about the people God is making you into. What God holds us responsible is our lives. We are all accountable to him. We can't oftentimes change the world. We can't make right a lot of the wrongs we see around us. But the thing that God wants us to see about Noah is that he was a man who stewarded his life. He managed his heart. And there are three things that the writer points out here about Noah that is going to help us weather wicked environments. They're going to help us uh, survive the floods that may come our way, if I can use the, the same figure of speech that's used here. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have in Noah is not a perfect saint in his performance, because we're going to see how after the flood, he makes some really bad decisions. But you're going to see three things that are going to help you become the men and women God wants you to be, even in a corrupt culture. Even having some sort of peace and patience, knowing that the end will come and will we survive? And so these three things are meant to encourage our hearts and they're found in the life of Noah. Look at verses eight and nine again in chapter six. What we have here is an incredible description of his heart, his life. It says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of, of the generations of Noah. He was a righteous man. He was blameless in his time. He walked with God. And as I mentioned before, he was a solitary saint. You ever feel like everyone around you wants to choose what is not of God? And yet I want God. I want to do righteously, and yet I see, it seems like I'm filled with unrighteous people in my life. See, he was a solitary saint. He had kids that he had raised well who married, and there were eight of them who loved Jesus. And yet it probably feels lonely. You probably feel isolated going, what? You want me to be this kind of person, but the cu culture around me does not want me to be this kind of person. And so how do we navigate these things? So he shows us how to faithfully endure in the midst of great w wickedness. And how do we do this? Firstly, we have to talk about righteousness. Righteousness is your standing before God. And this is important because look at verse 8. Before we know anything about Noah and his heart, his life, what we first find out is something glorious about God. Noah found favor in God's eyes, meaning God looks upon Noah and shows him grace. This is the root. This is the beginning. This is the starting point for any God-honoring life. God first shows you grace. He takes the initiative. He takes the lead. This is why 1 John chapter 4 says, we only love him because he first loves us. And so what we have to understand is that when God reaches you with his grace, righteousness will be a product of that. You do not become righteous through any of your good deeds or your good works. Righteousness is not something you earn because of your merit. You receive righteousness as a gift from God. And we need to be clear on this before, because before Noah does anything, God chooses this man. And so righteousness has to do with our standing before God. What's interesting is if you circle the word righteousness in verse 9, this is the first time this word is used in the Bible. And righteousness is such an important theme in Scripture. And before we know anything about this man, we see that he is righteous. And again, that is the product of God showing him grace. And so righteousness now is a proof of God showing me grace, not the other way around. God's grace, ladies and gentlemen, comes before anything. Write down these two verses, Deuteronomy chapter 7. I chose, with a, I chose to go with two verses, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament, to show you that this is an equal uh, opportunity teaching point throughout Scripture. Look what Moses says to Israel. It's not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. 
but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping an oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Moses is so in line with what I'm sharing with you, saying it's not because you did anything that God loves you. He chose to love you because of his own sovereign will. Amen? Then you go to the New Testament equivalent of this, and it's a very familiar passage, one that we ought to, ought to commit to memory, and that's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. Don't you think for a moment you can take any credit for what God's done in you. For both grace and faith is a gift given to you. It is the gift of God, not a result of works that anyone should boast. It's not because you have black hair and so blonde hair that God chose you. It's not because you were overweight or underweight that God chose you. It's not because you were black or white that God chose you. It's not because you had a, a six-figure salary or you, you're unemployed that God chose you. It's not because, boy, your prayers are so much better than that other guy who can't pray worth a darn. It's not why God chose you. God chooses of his own sovereign will and will never know why God chooses, but here's what I do know. You ought to praise God for his choosing. God is good. And you want to know why he's good? <laughs> he's good that Boy, the fact that he chose anyone at all is a miracle of grace. Because God could have wiped out every single person from the earth, including Noah and his family, and been totally right and just to do it. But the fact is, he has chose to set his love on some. Don't bicker, don't complain, don't hold your fist at him and say, why don't you just, God didn't have to do it, but he does, and that is grace. And because of that grace, we ought to be righteous people in our lives. See, Noah receives grace. And he receives grace, which then results in righteousness. And even that righteousness is not a righteousness of his own. Because guess what? We're not righteous people. The only righteousness that counts, and you need to write this down. The only righteousness that counts is the righteousness Jesus gives us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It's not on the screen. Just write it down and look at it later. The only righteousness that counts in God's economy is Jesus' righteousness. The only righteousness is going to get you through this life and into eternity is the righteousness of Christ. Even our righteousness is nothing that is self-derived or self-produced. It comes to us because those who bend the knee to the Savior, Jesus, receives his righteousness. This is called imputed righteousness. You're given on your account his righteousness, and thank God he clears your account of your sin. What would you have? Would you rather go through life with your sin or would you rather go with your life forgiven of your sin with Jesus' righteousness on your account? That's good stuff right there. Imputed righteousness. And so God's grace changed Noah's life completely. God's grace leads to righteous living. Thank God he steps in and does what we could never do for ourselves. And, and it's such a testimony to God's grace. Are we all cool with that? So we start there. Because there's none of this other stuff to follow if we don't get this, this right. Which leads us to our second point. Blamelessness. This is his conduct before people. His righteousness, which is an internal topic. The righteousness that is going on in my life because of the grace of God will have an external impact. And what does internal righteousness erupt into? It erupts into or overflows into blameless living. This is how the world perceives us. Noah was a man who had integrity in his culture's eye. See, we can think about another character in the Old Testament, a guy named Daniel. If you remember Daniel, Daniel lived such a, a blameless life that they couldn't pin anything bad on this guy. Now, this is not to say these guys were perfect. This is not to say these guys did not sin. This is not to say they didn't have failure and they didn't make mistakes. But what they want you to know is this, that you can choose God and his ways over the world's ways. 
You can choose to live lives of holiness and purity. This is what it means to be blameless. It's saying, I'm not going to choose to live in conformity to the world. I'm going to choose to live in conformity to Christ. I want his character. I want his traits to be present in me. This is evidence of your righteousness. That again is all of Christ and none of you. And so when you start bearing fruit, when you start living in a certain way, people will see that you are different and you are blameless. Your conduct before, him, before them will be of uh, great integrity. And so he is purposely saying in a world of corruption, I'm going to choose to abstain from sin. And I want you to write that phrase down. Abstain from sin. So many times when we hear the word abstinence, we automatically think sex. I'm going to tell you that the Bible is clear when it comes to every decision we make, every choice that we encounter ought to be one where we as God's people say, what will honor God? What will reflect his grace upon my life? And I will choose God and not choose the opposite. So really what the Christian life is, is about is daily saying, I'm going to abstain from sin, which so easily wants to entangle us, which so easily wants to ensnare us. It's, it's, it's so hard to, to, to do away with the old life, right? Sin like appears and says, remember me. And it wants to tempt you to go back into your old ways. And God says, when you choose to abstain from sin and you choose me, I'm going to give you the power to look different, to act different, to choose different. And so when you live a blameless life, when you seek to be a person of integrity, you're choosing to abstain from sin. Because nothing you choose of sinful, uh, that's sinful is ever going to bring you closer to God or reflect his character in your life. He has called us out of this world. You're no longer in darkness. You're in the light. So live as people of the light. Walk in the light. Make sure your life is, is reflective of that of your Savior who gave his life for you. And so Noah is blameless in his culture. Now, you wish everyone around you was like, we're so glad you're here and living the life of integrity and living. I'm sure Noah experienced jeers and scoffing and ridicule because he was doing something that was so different from the rest of the world. Have you ever experienced that as a, as a follower of Jesus, as someone who has called, them, called themselves a Christian and says, it is hard to live. A, a life that's honoring to God in the midst of, of different circumstances and situations. Whether we're talking about a school environment or a workplace or environment, even your own home, it is so difficult to live for the glory and honor of God. Would you say amen to that? And yet, God says, it's worth it. It's worth it because, you know, most of us know that Noah built an ark but we tend to forget what's more important than him building an ark. What's more important is the fact that he built a godly character and a godly family. And more than anything we do, we ought to be more fixated on the people we ought to be. Amen? I think that's a tweet-worthy moment. Go ahead and get out your devices. Tweet that one out. More than anything we do, a focus should be more on the people that God wants us to be. Because the Bible talks about Noah not necessarily celebrating the fact that he built an ark. The Bible celebrates, here's a man who lived by faith. Which brings us to our third point, and this is where the rubber meets the road. Because, you know, in, in theory, this sounds good and it sounds achievable, but yet there's maybe something about us that we're going, but, but how do I really do this? How do I, how do, I do this when I leave this place? You know, some of you talk about, hey, we come to church, we get that shot in the arm, and by Monday, it's like the, it's all worn off. The medicine's worn off. We're just kind of back into our old ways again. Here's the key. Here's the key to your quote-unquote spiritual success. Number three, faithfulness. Your commitment to God. Notice the last thing in verse nine it says of Moses. I mean, Noah. Why do I want to talk about Moses? We'll talk about Moses some other time. 
He was righteous, he was blameless, and he walked with God. Now I'm going to tell you right now, like one day when I die and you're going to put something on my headstone, will you put that phrase, if it's true of me? Because I can't think of a better phrase to go out on. He walked with God. Would people know this about, I mean, it's one thing for you to ask for that to be put on your tombstone, but would people put that on your tombstone? He walked with God. What does that mean? He or she walked with God. It means that their life was committed to what God wanted, not what they wanted. And that's what faithfulness is. Faithfulness is not doing what you want. Faithfulness is doing what God wants. And I'm going to tell you one thing right now is that the intimacy that Noah had with God to even do the things he did required an intimate relationship. Faithfulness is derived from intimacy. God welcomed Noah into his presence. And, I, and I'm, I'm imagining the conversations. Like, here's God saying, okay, Noah, here's what's going to happen. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And not once do you read Noah saying, you know what, God? Uh, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if this is right. I didn't know what you're talking about. You realize Noah doesn't say anything. He doesn't say anything in chapter 6. He doesn't say anything in chapter 7. He doesn't say anything in chapter 8. You know how Noah's faithful? He is faithful by listening to God and then doing what God says for him to do. There's no fighting. There's no struggle. There's no debate. It's just like, here's a man who just lovingly, willingly accepts what God wants. You know what this is called? Costly obedience. When you're asked to do something that is just crazy different than what's going on in your culture, right? Like you're living in the middle of Nevada. Has anyone ever driven through Nevada? I mean, there's, there's some really barren areas in Nevada, right? And all of a sudden God says, I want you to go out and build an, an ark bigger than the Cardinal Stadium. And I, and I want you to just let people know that, you know, God's going to send a flood and they're just going, we haven't had a stitch of water out here in 55 years. And yet M- Noah did it. And we're going to talk about this, 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 this account of the ark and the flood and how, boy, it, what God gives us is, is so good and we need to, re- it's too much for today. But the fact that Moses, that Noah did it, I want to talk about Moses for some reason. <laughs> Moses. He had daily contact with God. He was in continual communication with God. God, I'm building an ark. I'm getting the blueprints from you. Notice how detailed it is, right? I want you to do this. Here's the type of wood I want you to use. Here's how I want you to hold it all together. Here's the size of it. Here's all the animals I want you to bring. And Noah does it. And he does it because he's in loving connection with God. And when you're in loving connection with God, he'll often tell you to do things that do not sound reasonable. They may sound absurd, But because he loves you and he's even telling you these things, you know what you do as a reflection of your commitment to him? You just do it. You do it. This is why obedience is costly. The Bible speaks nothing of cheap obedience. It doesn't speak anything of cheap grace. When God calls us to do something, he is looking for a heart to respond. I mean, there's a whole new arrangement that's going to happen with the world. I mean, there's a flood. Noah and and seven others will be saved. And all of a sudden, they'll come through the flood and there's a whole new arrangement for living. And this is something we have to understand. That God is Lord. He is sovereign. He has the right over us. He has the right to rule us. He has the right to regulate us. He has the right to command us. And all we are asked to do is obey. So imagine Noah. Noah. For 120 years. Write that down. He's building the ark. Some of you can't go 120 minutes and stay focused on something. How about 120 seconds? That's me. Let's see that rabbit. You know, we're just all over the place. For 120 years. I'm going to borrow a phrase from Frederick Nietzsche, who is actually an antagonist to Christianity, but I like the phrase because it communicates what we as disciples ought to embrace. And when it comes to our lives, it is a long obedience in the same direction. 
a long obedience in the same direction. 120 years, Noah does two things. Notice his two ministries. He preaches righteousness and he builds an ark. He preaches righteousness to a culture that doesn't want to hear about righteousness. And yet in the meantime, he's also building an ark, which required a lot of resources, which required a lot of labor, which required a lot of time, and yet we don't see any wavering in this man's life. It was a long obedience in the same direction. Can I encourage you guys as God's people, keep on keeping on. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. God has given us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. Just keep moving in a singular direction. Things may come, try to trip you up, get you distracted, but like Noah, have a singular focus. You need to have myopic vision when it comes to what God has called you to be, and that is called, he's calling you to be like Christ. And he will perform that work. He will perfect that work in you. And so you are called to keep preaching and to keep building and to keep doing and just choose God every day. Abstain from sin every day and he will give you the power to do this. This is the testimony of Noah. And he followed the stipulations and I'm sure he endured the mockery. And Jesus says, Something so precious to us in, in Matthew chapter 5. Write down these verses. Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12. Jesus says, you will be blessed if you suffer for doing what's right. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. There we go. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now stop right there. It doesn't say, blessed are those who are persecuted because you're obnoxious. Any, any obnoxious people out there? Just come on. Obnoxious Anonymous. Here we are. OA. Welcome to OA, brothers, sisters. There's people out there who would call themselves Christians, and they think they are blessed by God because they are obnoxious. Obnoxious Christians, are a, they're a stench in the nostrils of God. You're not being blessed because you're persecuted for being an idiot, right? Even though I do think there probably is a little special place in heaven for the idiots. Oh, there's the idiot section right over there. You don't want to go to that neighborhood, but it, let's continue with the words of Jesus. Blessed are those who per, are persecuted for doing what God wants, for honoring God in your life, for, do, for living a life the way God wants you to live it, right? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Notice, it's because you're living for Jesus that Jesus says you will be rewarded. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for, us, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, there's a promise for those who choose to live righteously in an unrighteous age. There's a promise from Jesus who says, I know what it's like to be mocked and to be reviled and to be ridiculed for wanting to honor God. You can do it. Run the race with endurance and know that the author and perfect of your faith who has gone before you is ready to receive you into his arms and say, well done. Well done. And so we have Noah with these two ministries. And, and this is really what separates the wheat from the chaff the sheep from the goats. I was listening to the radio this week and uh, any uh, baseball fans out there, go to Diamondbacks, right? Even though we may differ on football teams, we can all be singularly focused on the D-backs, right? And the radio personality was talking about baseball was saying, and he used a phrase I thought was great because here we're heading into August and in August and here's where the, the team starts separating themselves. And he said, this is this time of the year when we separate the contenders from the pretenders. And I go, that's awesome. See, when, when the end of the season is drawing near and you've had, I mean, how many games have they played so far? 1,000, 1,500 games so far this season? It seems like it, doesn't it? that all of a sudden you come to that time of year where now people really start proving how good they are. And I'm saying, go Diamondbacks, go down with the Dodgers, right? 
The Doyers, yeah, God, Satan's team. But yeah, that's another story for another time. Almost as bad as the Yankees. Maybe worse, I don't know. Um, or the Red Sox. Who was wearing a Red Sox shirt today? Was it, oh, Sarah. Yeah, look at, she's raising her hand proudly. I, would, I wouldn't be so excited about that, but uh, okay. Another story for another time. Um, this is a time when we are separating the contenders from the pretenders, when things start to get serious. How true of that it is when it comes to spirituality. When things get difficult, who's going to press into Jesus and who's going to walk away from Christ? See, your faithfulness, not just during the good seasons, the feasting times, but when the famine happens or the floods come, where will you go? And Noah pressed in to God. He was committed to God. And so we are separating the contenders from the pretenders. Will you contend for the faith? And that is biblical language right there from the book of Jude. Will you contend for the faith? Will you? Or are you just trying to look the part? What you do during difficult times is going to reveal your relationship with God. Just like a zoo I read about in Egypt that had this funny looking little zebra on display and some students said, that is not a zebra. It's too small and the ears were too small. It found out that they had painted stripes on a donkey to try to pass it off as a zebra. Same thing with China. They tried to do this with a dog and pass it off as a lion a couple of years ago. You remember seeing those pictures? It does not work. Now for little kids, maybe they're like, oh, but for the well-trained eye, do not try to pass off a donkey as a zebra. God says, what will you be? Will you be the genuine article? I hope so. Last point is this. Because what you need to know is as you contend for the faith, God has promised you his care. So what is God's promise of care? Three things, and we'll continue this next week as well. Three things. Number one, God determines to rescue. Number Two, God designs the rescue. And number three, God delivers the rescued. This is setting us up for what's to come. So number one, God determines the rescue. The fact that God even to de- chooses to do anything is remarkable. The fact that he has determined to rescue us, to redeem us, to save us. I'm sitting there going, thank you. He didn't have to, but he does. God could have wiped out the world completely at the time of Noah, but he doesn't. He chooses to save eight people, one family, and he has proved to be just and righteous all the same. So the fact that God determines the rescue is such a wonderful picture of grace and mercy on display. Number two, he's going to design the rescue. There's no coming to God and saying, I want to be saved this way. God says, nope not going to happen. He's going to design the rescue. And so he reminds Noah that there's no security outside the ark that he's going to build. That God does not entrust the means of salvation to human imagination. I mean, let's be honest. If we're going to be saved, we're going to come up with a whole different, I mean, that's religion. Religion is coming up with our own way of saying, this is how I want to be saved. And if if I came up with my own religion, here's how I would want to be saved. Let's just drink lots of coffee and play a lot of golf, and we'll get to heaven that way. Anyone want to follow me on my new religion? No? Because you're not good golfers or you don't like coffee? I don't know. uh, We'll talk about that later. But isn't it interesting that God is the one who designed salvation, and what a peculiar way to save the world. That he himself comes down, dwells among us, lives a perfectly righteous life, And dies upon a criminal's cross that he didn't deserve to die on, but he did it. Why? So that he could be the sin bearer of those who are sin infected. And we sit there and scratch our our head and like the passage Mike read, it is foolishness to the world. Are you kidding me? You're going to make me believe in a God that it seems like it's divine cosmic, you know, child abuse. Sending your son to die for the sins of the world. And yet, this is the way God chose to save the world. And God will always tell you he will save on his terms. You bring nothing to the table. There's no, you know, conversation about how do you want this thing to go? God designs the rescue. The plan of building an ark was not dreamed up by Noah. (laughs) The plan of a worldwide cataclysmic flood was not dreamed up by Noah. And yet... 
the 120 years of building an ark provided a powerful object lesson to speak of righteousness that 2 Peter talks about. There's no out there building. 